think the biggest thing is just admitting what you don't know. I think for a long time, I, I, I maybe put off the entrepreneurial path because I thought to myself, Oh, I don't, you know, I don't fully understand every dimension of a business. And so I'm not ready. You know, I think, I think that was actually a big motivator for wanting to go to the incubator because you have all these resources and all these people that have, you know, maybe deeper expertise than you do. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think one thing that's so fun and energizing about the entrepreneurial journey is also figuring out that stuff on the fly (laughs) and and just being resourceful, tapping into your network, um, reading, educating yourself, you know, meeting people and, and, you know, sort of soaking up their expertise. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, uh, Ken Babcock, and uh, Ken was uh, born and raised in a small farm town in, uh, in New York. Um, then, uh, was driven to go to Cornell for college and, uh, went in and studied business there, met his wife while I was in college, graduated, and then went and worked for Deloitte and gained a lot of business skills, uh, and joined Uber in, uh, 2014 and moved to San Francisco across the country, um, was, uh, tasked with, uh, building and launching, uh, the, the business in different locations, um, and then also took on a few different roles, including some in data science, and then decided to go off and start his own company, um, had the op- or as he was doing that, had the opportunity to go to an incubator, go to Harvard Business School, decided to go to Harvard Business School, met what is his uh, current co- or co-founders of his current business and is uh, building and growing that now. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Ken. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, hope uh, hope you got a chance to catch your breath after that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I always like to to make or get a condensed or consolidated version, and then uh, you get a or expand it out and, and tell us the full story. So, without any further ado, um, you know, unpacking that a bit, tell us how your your journey got uh, started growing up in New York in a small farming town. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I grew up in in Pembroke, New York, which is um, directly between Buffalo and Rochester. So. Uh, you know, still pretty close to those cities, but, you know, most of, uh, you know, most, most of what you see in Pembroke is a lot of cornfields, dairy farms, um, or, you know, my family didn't have that, but a lot of my friends did. And so, uh, you know, for me growing up there, uh, Cornell was kind of always like a goal for me. It was sort of in my backyard, about two and a half hours away. I was mm-hmm. very familiar with sort of the Finger Lakes region and Ithaca where Cornell is located. And so, in my mind, if I did well enough in in high school, you know, I'd, I'd get the opportunity to cor- go to Cornell, and um, I did. By the time that I was a senior, get accepted, uh, I decided to enroll. Uh, and Cornell, you know, really opened me uh, up to a lot of new opportunities. I, I ended up studying business there, um, really just thinking like, you know, everything's a business, <laughs> so why don't I go? Uh, study business you know there wasn't any particular like subject area that I was super passionate about Mm. what was cool about Cornell was just getting exposed to a lot of different people from different places different experiences backgrounds Um, and so it was just you know for me just a way to kind of soak up a lot of like understanding of the world that you know maybe I hadn't been exposed to previously so now you go off to Cornell, and I think if I remember when we chatted a bit before, um, you um, <clears throat> got a degree in business. Is that right? Yeah. So Cornell calls it uh, applied economics. So there's a lot, there's a you know sort of a foundational economics education, but then taking that um, and applying it to a lot of like sort of real world case studies and, and you know business circumstances. We actually used a lot of Harvard Business School case studies when I was in undergrad some of those classes so ending up going to HBS later was kind of funny you know I saw some cases that you know reminded me of undergrad 
So now let me ask one question and it's completely aside and off topic, but I always just curious. So like when I see applied and then economics or applied, whatever, is there unapplied economics or, you know, it seems like every, <laughs> you should always apply, or apply economics. So I'm just always curious how they, or why they put that in the name of the degree. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good <laughs> question. Yeah. I never really thought about it that way. I mean, cause we did have, there was, um, I guess the opposite of applied would be theoretical economics. We did have a, an economics degree that you could take uh, that was not related to the, the, the courses that I took. But I think the idea was, hey, let's get away from a lot of these utility curves, um, a lot of these, you know, theoretical supply and demand and mm. um, actually talk about, you know, what that means, whether it be, okay, hey, let's look at supply and demand curves uh, when it comes to like international trade and finance and like who gets the surplus. Um, so there's a lot of ways to kind of build upon that, but bringing in, you know, more real world examples and understanding where those models break down, which I think was the most important thing is like, mm. you can understand that foundation, you know, but, but acknowledge that, okay, a lot of this, a lot of these economic concepts are purely that, and the real world is going to stress those in a lot of different ways. And so that's what I appreciate about the majors. We understood how like, Hey, you learn this thing, but it's, it's probably going to break down in the real world. Hmm, interesting. All right. Well, it, it was just an aside. Just so was yeah. interested. I hear that applied physics, applied economics. I'm like, it seems like they should really always apply this to the real world that you can actually use it as, as part of a, a as a career. But that's my aside. Um, so now you come out of school. So you've got the, you know, kind of the business tent, applied ec or economics, and you're going out. And I think that, you know, you started, uh, you started working for a, a firm or doing a, or working for a business. So kind of what was that uh, next yeah. uh, phase of your journey? I think it was with Deloitte. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I went into um, Deloitte's consulting practice uh, where they work with large, mostly fortune 500 companies to, you know, solve a wide range of issues. I mean, Deloitte's a, a huge company and they worked with huge companies. And so my thinking, you know, going into that, field out of out of undergrad was this is just going to keep a lot of doors open and allow me to explore and understand things um it was also just you know a really good education in client service and and just generally like professionalism and, and you know not just being professional and courteous but how do you frame presentations how do you you know help clients you know follow along with your thought process, which is all stuff that I've brought forward um, into my career today. So I was only at Deloitte for a year because I got a really unique opportunity to join Uber in 2014. It was um, during a period where, you know, Uber was kind of striving for, um, you know, a lot of growth and just ubiquity um, everywhere you know we had, we had used it a bunch on, on a lot of my consulting teams you know we'd, we'd fly to client sites and then you'd need a car from the airport to get to the client site and so you know i started using uber then i thought oh my gosh wow like this is going to completely change how people move around in mm. cities um, and it was doing that already in a lot of places and so i went there um, specifically joined a team focused on launch and so you know the idea was really okay, hey, we've launched, I think at that point, it was like 180 markets. We've launched 180 markets. How do we extract learnings from those markets to understand, okay, if we're going to launch now, another... Before you dive too yeah. deep into I just had one question. Because yeah. I mean, you're at Deloitte, great company, certainly name recognizable, sounds like it was a good situation. So did you, when you decided to move over to Uber, was it, hey, they fired you and you had to find a job, which I don't think it, it didn't sound like it was, was it, hey, I'm looking for a new adventure. I want to go see California. This is a great company. Or kind of, you know, what was that decision making process of, hey, I'm going to leave the business of yeah. the company that I'm currently working for and go do something different? So, yeah, there were a few factors. I mean, I, I had interned with Deloitte while I was in undergrad as well. So it felt like I was there longer than a year. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing too, is I had, I had, you know, one of my last projects at Deloitte, um, I got to work very closely with, uh, a great manager. Um, and it was sort of a two, two person project. I mean, we would go to the client site and work directly with them and, uh, learned a lot from him. He had spent most of his career actually at Dell, 
like working in tech. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think he was someone where, you know, I really looked up to him and admired him and a lot of his background. And so when I had the opportunity to actually like myself move into tech, it became, became kind of a no brainer. And, and like you said, like I'd lived in New York my whole life. So, um, upstate New York, uh, Cornell is obviously in upstate New York and then Deloitte, I was, I was based out of New York city. And so, you know, I had spent maybe 24 hours in California by the time that I <laughs> decided to move there. Um, and again, I mean, I think this, this theme of exploring opportunities, you know, keeping doors open, you know, for me, it was kind of like, okay, well, let's go, let's go see what that's all about. You know, I never really spent a ton of time there. So no, and that makes uh, that makes perfect sense. So now you go out to California, you start working for Uber. Uh, you know how long how long did you work for him? How long were you there? And how did that uh, that transition go? So I was I was with Uber for four and a half years. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the launch role that that I was on. That's that's sort of where I started. Cut my teeth. We launched a bunch of markets after I joined. I think four hundred more, and so. It was really trying to understand, you know, how can we drive efficiency and how can we drive understanding of our own business through this like repeatable playbook? So we were constantly documenting, validating, analyzing um, everything that made Uber tick. And so started there, um, eventually moved into a data science team on what was called like kind of our marketplace product. So I think everything back end at at uber the routing pricing um you know surge dynamic pricing mm-hmm. uh matching you know whether it was like uber pool and so there's a lot of stuff that just like you know happened behind the scenes and this was the team that was constantly trying to refine that mm-hmm. and finish up my time there um in more of a, a product strategy role so supporting executives on some of their initiatives so now you work there, exciting company. California is a great place, although it depends on you know where you live and how if you can afford it and 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 whatnot. But I think it'd be a fun place, and it sounds like you had a great experience. So as you're you know wrapping that up, what made you decide? Because I think at one point you know you talked about, and when we talked before, you were going to maybe do an accelerator, and during that period, you also got accepted into Harvard Business School. So kind of what prompted one the the change, and then how did you decide where you're going to go from there? Yeah, totally. Um, I knew from my experience at Uber, and I, I wouldn't say this was always the case, but I knew from being at Uber that I wanted to eventually start a company. Um, it was such a entrepreneurial place to work. Um, mm. I mean, it was always, you know, the entire time that I was there, it was still a, you know, a big company. And um, but, but that being said, even within a big company, if you found an opportunity or a challenge or something that could be solved and had an idea for how to move forward, you could usually pursue it. And that's really what entrepreneurship is. Like you see if there's an opportunity or a challenge that can be solved and you go for it. And so that was just so energizing for me. I knew I wanted to start a company somehow. Mm. I I joined when I left Uber after four and a half years, I I joined, um, an incubator atomic for about six months. And so the idea there was, okay, this could be my founding experience where I have a lot of resources. I have a lot of support. Um, I think I mentioned it to you, my founding with training wheels experience, and I could, you know, help them kind of get something from zero to one. Mm. During that time, I got accepted to, to Harvard business school. And then, you know, atomic was a great situation um, for me just to like soak up a lot of knowledge you know, but I still felt like I was kind of like working on other people's ideas, you know, and, and helping stand those up. And so I looked at Harvard Business School as a way for me to take a step back, kind of think about what it was that I was really passionate about, or, or maybe what have I developed a deep experience in that I can bring to market in a, in a product. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing too, is like, I could potentially meet some co-founders there, you know, people that are also interested in entrepreneurship, are also at this moment in their lives where they're taking a step back, thinking about what they want to do. And um, most of their time can be spent doing that. So I decided to go to Harvard Business School, um, which, you know, was a was a great decision because I ultimately did meet my co-founders there. So, you know, no, and I think that, you know, 
both of them are good opportunities, right? Going and doing a, an incubator, going through that process can be a great experience. Harvard, even if it's nothing else, you have the Harvard stamp of uh, on your resume and uh, on your on your pedigree always is beneficial and certainly a great school as well to, to be able to provide that opportunities. And sounds like you also got to meet some great co-founders. So now as you're coming out of Harvard, did you go right to founding your own business with your co-founders or did you do something else or kind of what was that period? Now you go get your MBA from Harvard and get the, the business background and meet your co-founders. Where'd you go from there? Yeah, so we, um, myself, Brian, and Dan, those are my, my two co-founders. We, yeah, we met on on day one. Um, <laughs> so we've been introduced to mutual friends and said, oh, you guys need to meet up. Like you're all you're all starting school at the same time. Um, so it was it was quite literally the first day of classes. Uh, but we didn't we didn't start with like you know ideas on day one, right? It was getting to know each other, realizing that we had just similar values as as people and um similar interest areas and then that's when we you know started really talking about ideas i think um mm. that foundation of just kind of getting along and sharing values i mean that's that's critical in starting any company and so you know i think maybe a month in we started meeting up weekly talking through a lot of ideas uh, that we had some that were good, some that were bad, uh, a lot that were bad. But um, what kept coming up in our conversations was that we were all passionate about team performance. Brian had had um, a tutoring business that his family ran, and he participated as a tutor for a long time. Um, and he always, you know, was very passionate about, you know, how do you educate, teach people, get them up to speed. Dan had done a lot of mentorship things, was actually captain of the Brown football team, like teamwork and focus on teams was always something he cared about, you know, and then for me, um, I became a, a manager of teams at, at a pretty early point in my career at Uber. I mean, that was kind of the trajectory of Uber is like you, you do well, you become a manager and you may not have all the training. Um, but I was constantly faced with this question of like, okay, I've got these high performers, we have people who are struggling, like, how do I connect the dots? Like, how do I bring everybody up to speed? And so that was that theme around team performance is ultimately what we started to dive into. And that was where the inspiration for Tango came from. No, it makes makes perfect sense. So, you know, and I always, I think there's every experience I've ever been in with every startup, you go through a lot of bad ideas and sometimes you pursue those. And I don't know, they're always bad ideas. You're always excited about it at the time and you always think they're going to be a great idea. And, you know, eventually you come to find out, hey, this may not be the perfect idea or it may not be the one that, uh, you know, I'm want air that uh, I'm going to end up pursuing. And, you know, you, you find yeah. that out at some point. So, you know, definitely resonate with that. So now you guys come up with the idea, you start to build the business, you start to, you know, have the different their skill sets and pursue it with the idea of, you know, increasing perform, you know, performance with team members or, or companies and helping employees and everybody to optimize, you know, their efficiency and to, their performance. How's it gone? Where are you guys at today? And kind of uh, what's the status? Sure. Yeah. So we started working on Tango in earnest, right? January of 2020. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the sort of <laughs> the two months before the pandemic, uh, and, you know, I think we saw something there. I mean, we treated it probably initially as more of a like side project, but we were having interesting conversations with potential customers. They were helping us kind of think through the problem space and what, what could be a solution. And, um, you know, what we, what we kind of honed in on was, okay, well, if we want to increase the performance of teams, we got to get, you know, more knowledge out of the heads of high performers. Mm. The way that happens today is those high performers are expected to, you know, host shadowing sessions, teach people, document their work. And the reason it's not happening is because, you know, high performers tend to be the ones who are also the busiest and they don't have enough time to carve out to create documentation or spend time with people. And on the documentation piece, things get out of date really quickly. And so, you know, once you've documented it, there's a shelf life. And so with Tango, what we said was, how can we make documentation less of this like mental hurdle for high performers? How can we make it passive? How can we make it easy for them to do? And so with that idea in mind, you know, the pandemic hit in March of 2020, 
those conversations we were having with customers became so much more urgent around this topic. Uh, they were remotely onboarding people for the first time. Um, their teams had gone distributed and remote. And, and so we took that as like, holy cow, like there's something here. Like maybe we've caught lightning in a bottle. Like let's, we need to go build this. And so we actually left Harvard Business School after a year. So we, we didn't, we ended up getting our MBAs, but um, mm. uh, that decision was fairly clear to us because we were there to, we wanted to go to HBS to do something entrepreneurial. We ended up pursuing it maybe earlier than our, than we expected and, um, you know, went out and did our fundraise with Tango in the fall of 2020. We're successful with that. And um, I guess ever since then, it's really been about how do we build a great product? How do we build a great team? So the team today is is 26 um, with a ton of awesome backgrounds and experiences. And it's actually 26 people across 13 states. So um, a true pandemic company, you know, we're all working remotely. Uh, and then on the product side, you know, what we've done is kind of what, what, what we initially set out to do, which was make documentation a, you know, a frictionless, delightful experience. So we have a Chrome extension today that allows you to capture any digital process that you do as you do it. And then we automatically create that documentation. And that documentation is step-by-step -step tutorials, complete with screenshots, descriptions, URLs, um, and we give you the ability to edit it. And so that product has resonated a ton with the people that are feeling that problem of documentation. And so we're at 150,000 users today. I mean, all types of companies, functions, um, which, you know, can be a little tricky when you're talking about who do we build for, but uh, it's clear that this problem of documentation is too difficult, it gets stale very quickly and I need something easier, th that that resonates a ton. And so, you know, we're, we're the ones who are trying to be the solution for that. And so we see a lot of users who come in and say, holy cow, where has this been all my life? Why weren't you here <laughs> two, three, four years ago? Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's really confirming around, you know, the, the product market fit we have for those people. No, that's awesome. It sounds like you found a, a great uh, product market fit. It's been a good experience and uh, seeing some success there. So that's, that's awesome. So, well, as we uh, reach kind of the present day of your journey and kind of where the business is at and where things have taken you, it's a great time to transition to the two questions I always ask at the end of each episode. So we'll jump to those now. So the yeah. first question I always ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? What'd you learn from it? Yeah. So I, I would say this is like the biggest mess that I ever had to clean up. Um, so I mentioned, you know, when I was in data science at Uber, um, I was on the marketplace team, which, which handled pricing. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things that became a huge mess was um, around, you know, basically like driver commission. So drivers get commission on every Uber ride. Like that's, that's fairly straightforward, but there's a lot of pieces. If you've ever looked at an Uber receipt, there are so many components to what goes into that. You know, there used to be a safe rides fee. There'd be a city tax. Sometimes you'd see in New York, like uh, this is the black car fund for like livery drivers. So there's a lot of stuff that like adds up to that total. And some stuff is commission-based. We should be, you know, taking a commission and giving that back to the driver. And some of it we should, some of it should be a pass through. And so um, what ended up happening is uh, in this mess that we had to clean up, our pricing team basically didn't, didn't code everything the right way. So we were taking commission off of things that we should not have taken commission off of, um, mm. which was basically reducing driver earnings. And this has been going on for three years um, and it was specific to New York City. And so New York City, one of Uber's biggest markets, um, we've been taking the wrong commission too much. And so we owed a lot of these drivers a lot of money. And so um, my team on the pricing analytics side was actually the team that said, okay, we're gonna figure out how much it is that we owe these drivers and you know, basically issue individual refunds to each of them. Um, and just to give you a sense for the scale of this 
like mess this business decision uh mm. we, in some we ended up paying out over 90 million dollars back to these drivers so that was money that the business had captured that was rightfully you know should have been in the rightful hands of the drivers that that uber had because they miscalculated some things and so i think my you know my big takeaway from that was um you know i i think sometimes like you can lose sight of the details especially when you have a product as pervasive and as salient as as uber for a lot of people um mm. and you know there tends to be this like we could call it like a reinforcement bias. Like if you're doing well, trips are happening, people are signing up, you know, both riders and drivers, you're having a record week every week. You you tend not to question what's going on. <laughs> you tend to be like, it's all working. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think in this situation, because this lasted for three years, we just, we just weren't sweating the details. And so that's something that I continue to think about is like, you know, and, and granted, like sweating the details, there's a there's a limit on how much time you can spend doing that. But um, for certain things, especially when it's critical to the customer, you really you really want to sweat the details. No, I, I think that's the, definitely it's a, a fun mistake, fun mistake not to make, but a get, great one to, to hear and to learn from the one that, you know, big companies, everybody, you know, thinks big companies always have figured out or they think it's, you know, something this deceptive or they're trying to, you know, or, or, you know, rip someone off, so to speak. And I don't think that's always the case. And it's, it, it's hard to one, be a, per, or a company that's perfect no matter what, and no way company's ever perfect, but two, to, to get the understanding that everybody makes mistakes at all sizes of their businesses, and then it's how you go about dealing with those mistakes that, uh, that makes the, the, the difference there. So I think it's a great mistake yeah. to learn, or a great mistake to hear and a great one to learn from. Sure. Second question I have is, now if you're talking to someone who's just getting into a startup or a small business, what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them? I think the biggest thing is just admitting what you don't know. I think for a long time, I, I, I maybe put off the entrepreneurial path because I thought to myself, Oh, I don't, you know, I don't fully understand every dimension of a business. And so I'm not ready. You know, I think, I think that was actually a big motivator for wanting to go to the incubator because you have all these resources and all these people that have, you know, maybe deeper expertise than you do. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think one thing that's so fun and energizing about the entrepreneurial journey is also figuring out that stuff on the fly <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and just being resourceful, tapping into your network, um, reading, educating yourself, you know, meeting people and, and you know, sort of soaking up their expertise. Uh, that's, that's part of the fun of it too. And so I would say for folks like, you know, if you're honest with what you don't know, that's how you get help from other people. So I've said, you don't feel like you have those gaps, you know, um, and you can have more confidence in going out and, and pursuing a company. No, I think that's definitely a great takeaway and then definitely makes perfect sense. So, well, now as we wrap things up, if people want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? Sure. Uh, our website is tango.us um tango spelled like it sounds t-a-n-g-o um and if you want to reach out directly i'm uh ken k-e-n at tango.us um happy to happy to field any any questions or, or interest from from the community awesome well i definitely encourage people to reach out uh, connect uh, or connect and if nothing else make a new best friend so but with that, thank you again for coming on the podcast. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell and you'd like to be guests on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So just go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show. A couple more things as listeners. Um, if you can click share, subscribe, and leave us a review, it really helps us to be able to share all these awesome journeys with even more people. And last but not least, if you ever need help with your patents, your trademarks, or anything else with your startup, or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. We're always here to help. Well, thank you again for coming on the podcast, uh, Ken, and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thanks, Devin.